What's up, everybody? Jensen Cummings here. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. This episode of Best Serve Fresh, where we talk about fresh ideas, new approaches, best practices to the restaurant hospitality model. And today we are talking with Johnny Nunn, who is chef owner of Daisy Bar and Cafe, as well as Verdegree Restaurants, both in Portland, Oregon. Johnny, thank you for being on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. Hi. Hi, everybody. We're going to talk, as everyone saw, this is Best Served Podcast 156, Chef in the Garden. So we're going to be talking a little bit about the garden projects that kind of you work on and how you're bringing produce into your restaurants. Very fascinated in it, especially because just as chefs, I feel like getting the best produce is always part of our mission, yet sometimes we outsource so much of that to broadliners. For you, it's very integral to your brand, and I want to touch on that also as food systems and supply chains has been really challenged. I'm super interested in how localizing that might be the even smarter business decision. So we're going to get into that a little bit. Tell everybody, Johnny, Daisy Bar and Verdegree, what can they expect from your uh, two establishments? So they're both very small. Um, I guess I have a thing for restaurants that are smaller than your average apartment. Um, And uh, I don't know, kind of both intimate experiences. Verdegree has been around for, we're going into our seventh year soon. Um, Contemporary French, uh, you know, a lot of Mediterranean stuff, small, intimate. Wine list is uh, we'd like to kind of keep it, um, you know, Oregon based with uh, a lot of uh, old world stuff. But all the wine has been produced um, in kind of an old world uh, techniques. A lot of good Uh, juice in Oregon, for sure. So, yeah. Yes. Um, So uh, and, you know, honestly, it's nice to get some uh, some some uh, some Oregon wines on the map that people haven't heard of. Even our our, you know, wine loving guests are like. I've lived here my whole life and I've never heard of that wine and it's right around the corner. So there's just Ooh, so many. Tell us one wine. Now I need to know because we've done wine tours of Willamette Valley. I remember doing like private tastings at Drake Christopher with like passion, right. like crazy blow your mind stuff. What's uh what's one wine? Put so on one wine right uh, that I love is a uh, winemaker. This guy, Chris Berg, he does roots. Um, and he's in, uh, out of Yamhill County. I forget the, okay. the town. Sorry, Chris. Um, but he's from Wisconsin and went to K- Kansas University and it's just got like this mad scientist quality about him. He's awesome. like, you know, one of those guys in the movie where he kind of strikes, you know, the organ music will play if it focuses on him. And he's just he's just fun and loves uh, loves making good tasty wine. So Roots. I love it. Now I have one more yeah. place to go. I get to Portland yeah. once a year usually. Chris Berg, Roots, check it out. If you know, you yeah. know. If you don't, now you know. All right, keep going a little bit. The restaurants right, themselves. So, uh, and then uh, we got the opportunity to open um, another place. We went Italian for a year. We called it Corsetti, and then we just didn't love it. So we pivoted it into a, a bar and grill called Daisy Bar and, and Cafe. And it's got kind of a New orleans feel, oysters on the half shell, um, you know, house-made burgers, um, you know, we just kind of cook what's what we feel like. I'm I'm from D.C. My dad was okay. from the South. I love Southern food. I love New Orleans food. I worked at Town Hall in San Francisco, and that kind of I was kind of in the beginning of my uh, culinary journey, and that impacted me greatly. So um, I love cooking that way. Um, and uh, we'll take it back now because we always like the backstories, and I'm fascinated in this D.C. Town right. Hall in San Francisco. You had some time right. in the South. Now you're in Portland. You basically touched all the food groups of the yeah. United States. I know. So I, I was, I, was uh, I don't know. When I decided to start cooking, I just, I, I kind of got into it a little bit late professionally. We started kind of as the amateurs in, in college. I went to a small school on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. There was a lot of fish and game. And um, uh, and so we cooked a lot there. We all had, you know, houses off campus. And then would often, you know, skip school to cook. And um, who's so we? It kind of, it was, it was your little crew of, of yeah, uh, and actually three of us are chefs now. And if awesome. you know, what, you know, I can picture. I wish I had taken a picture of my dad when I told him, like, yeah, you know, I think I'm going to skip all that private school and college work and just go make minimum wage at this restaurant. Get yelled at for a while. <laughs> that, and makes total stuff. sense. It seems like a smart life path. Marilyn, I'm thinking about Marilyn. Did you ever go to Pierpoint, Nancy Longo's iconic restaurant there? No, uh, no. It's in Bal- I'm not familiar with it. Baltimore. Oh, Baltimore. Man. Yeah. I'm going back, get together with the cronies, and go get her crab cakes. We'll oh, change yeah. your life forever. 
Yeah, well, my dad was in the Navy, so I grew up kind of all around the Chesapeake. Gotcha. I first remember like being alive on the eastern shore of Virginia, which is across from Norfolk. And then uh, we went to D.C. when he got to the Pentagon. Um, but and then I went to school kind of all around there, too. And, um, you know, when I got to I was at Farallon in San Francisco it was one of my first big restaurants. And there was a few East Coast guys and a few Cali guys and guys from all over. And the big debate was between the blue crab and the Dungeness crab, you know, which is better, you know, yada, yada, yada. Oh, yeah. and it was fun. I was like, without question, it was like blue crab. And then everyone looked at me like I was nuts. Oh, and, the food debates yeah. rage on from barbecue to crab to all of yeah. that. I'm a big fan of, of which uh, seafood based stew on either coast is better. Uh, yeah. I, li I like the debate because I like them both. So I'm into it. Sure. If you want to debate I, mean, I got you no problem. Give me okay. your food. I'll eat it and I will tell you what I think. Yeah. I'm a fan. Yeah. So it started there, and then I was working. Uh, I moved to San Francisco right after I graduated. A good friend of mine who actually lives in Portland, um, uh, he moved to San Francisco, and I just went out and kind of stayed and started just loving the food scene. And actually, my first kitchen job was at Aqua for Michael Mina. Um, and uh, that first lasted about kitchen job was at Aqua. That's like a, a not, yeah, I, you know, I was honest. My, my brother, yeah, my bro, uh, my uh, grandmother owned a bed and breakfast, and I'd work for her a little bit. Just I wanted to learn how to chop onions and things like that. And you know, I was honest about where I was, but it just was way over my head. It lasted about three weeks, but it was just such a. It just informed me so much about what it was like, and I knew I wanted. I'd played athletics all through high school and played. A, I played lacrosse in college until. I didn't. Um, and then uh, it was just like it seemed a lot like athletics and I liked it. Um, it was mental times physical times emotional. Yeah. Uh, every night's a big game. And if you had a bad night, you got to redeem yourself right, you know, right away. And team dynamic um, for sure plays into it as well. Yeah, it was uncontrollable and the chaos of it. I mean, I definitely found the right spot, um, you know, uh, but. You know, it, it comes with its. It doesn't come without its drawbacks, too. Of course. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. We all know those far too well. What brings you to Portland? Uh, so I went from there. I went from Farallon to Town Hall, and then uh, got a job offer at Eleven Madison Park in New York to be the private dining chef. And about that time, friends of mine from San Francisco moved here from SF when I went to New York, and then um, so I was the private dining chef at Eleven Madison, and then. Um, regime change there. Daniel came in and took it to like, you know, number one in the world and yeah, was just like, the just world, blew everyone away. Country. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, I don't know if you ever had the chance to eat there, but like, it just became, it became, the, you know, this experience that has opened a lot of doors for me and just my own perception of food um, and how to approach not just food, but life. I mean, like I was, that guy was just, that guy's amazing. Um, and so then, um, went to Spain for a year and opened a restaurant in Madrid. Um, and then came back to New York was like in between tours of New York, you know, relationship had ended. I needed a new apartment and they came out to Portland to visit and never went back. And that was in 2007. Awesome. I love it. The relationship side of it, that part, either we follow somebody or we're getting away from somebody. I hear that a lot, which is fascinating. Uh, yeah, I don't know I what mean, that is, but you hear that a lot in restaurants. I think people are just ready for re ready for renewal. Also, the apartment was as big a thing because I had a killer apartment and it was ending. The <laughs> sublet was over, and I was like, "Oh god, I don't know where I'm gonna, I, you know, I don't know where I'm gonna live now." So, I moved out of here with a knife bag and a and a big duffel bag and my, um, you know, my at the time my my the CDs and the iPod, you know, and that was it. So, I love it. so then. Uh, you get to Portland, 2007. What happens the first couple of years? You kind of bouncing around yeah. a little bit uh, before you. Yeah, I got my first. I got my first chef job right away, within the first three months at um, in a nearby town called West Lynn. At yep. a, uh, to, oh, it was an opening restaurant um, called 503, and that went really well for like the first 14 months, and then October of 2008 happened, and we lost. 60% of our business overnight that Friday. I forget the date, but it was, they referred to it as black Friday. Yep. The phone just started ringing. We had about 65 reservations and we, by the end of the night, we had done like 15 covers. 
So that became sort of almost like a test version of what's going on now, you know, how to survive um, when it's slow. And I sent out a, uh, an email to our, to our mailing list recently, you know, noting the MK Fisher book, How to Cook a Wolf. Yep. I don't know if you're familiar with this one. It was, yep. uh, it was a restaurant in Seattle as well. And the wolf is the proverbial wolf at your door. And so that's what this is taking. That's what it took then. I mean, the guy's still open and we almost, you know, we were behind on rent. We were behind all the purveyors, but we just kind of figured out a way to, you know, keep paying me to keep the rent going, to keep everything going. And we actually started, you know, growing our own vegetables there too. I don't, you know, and I say we, I mean, other people that I know, I'm, I don't have a green thumb at all, but I can put it in a frying pan. There you go. All right, let's get into that. I really yeah. want to spend a good chunk of time talking about the gardens, talking about the importance. Yeah. So that was literally going to be my first place. My first question is like, where did the idea to be so integrated with farms, with farmers markets, with gardens become a part of the way that you wanted your restaurant to be? Well, I mean, I, I think that's just, you know, the modern, the modern evolution of it. I mean, that's what Jeremiah Tower and Alice Water started way back when. So the freshest ingredients you can get. Um, and, um, you know, when in this specific scenario, we had already developed a routine with, with some local guys, the, the urban farmer that we, we have been using for the last few years has like a lot in a bat, the side yard of a Baptist church a mile away and doesn't get more local than that. He was growing things for me specifically. We got the seed book out and we did that sort of the way that um, you know, David Kinch does it. I mean, Reza was the inspiration yeah. for that. And, um, you know, it, it just, you know, we, we, we wanted to keep it local. And of course we, we go to the farmer's market as much as possible and we, you know, try and make it. So the only things, you know, as much as we could, you know, there's exceptions to all these things because we still have to run the restaurant. If things aren't available that we need, then mm -hmm. we have to get them from wherever we get them. Um, then, uh, as much as we could, we would get them from, from, from local guys. The Victory Garden, as we started calling it since COVID-19 happened, you know, came, I just remember my mom telling me stories about her first memories of life were World War II. She still can't eat a Brussels sprout because that's what they grew on the windowsills. And I, I just suggest that it wasn't because of the Brussels sprout. It's because grandma couldn't cook. Yeah. You they know? boiled it in tepid, unsalted. Oh, yeah. It was, yeah. yeah. She's like, I still like the sulfur. I'm like, well, if you cook it well, it really well, it doesn't matter. And, actually resurrected her beets, her love for beets, because Can Libby's beets ruined a generation of beet eater in this country. Um, let's let's but, go there. I want to go there because yeah. I think that's interesting. Because yeah. So um, so we've been getting uh, we've been getting our produce from several places. Uh, my my wife and two kids have been um, uh, working hard on uh, the garden in the backyard. So randomly we bring stuff from there. Two of the other employees from here have gardens and. You know, I'll trade them uh, whatever they want from the, the pantry to bring in whatever they have for that day. Um, a former coworker, um, this guy, uh, Jonathan Negar, who is a uh, uh, culinary instructor here, owns a, a kind of an apartment complex, the really big backyard. And I think he vets the tenants there by how much they, they like gardening. Um, and that's been a good thing. You know, I trade bottles of wine for it and or a couple meals here and there. Um, and so that's been the real agenda is when the supply chain became threatened during this yeah. pandemic, we wanted to, A, you know, have ourselves covered as much as possible, even though we knew we could be as flexible as we wanted with this stuff. Um, we didn't, you know, if there were people that needed it elsewhere, but we had a source that was unique, we wanted to, you know, exploit that as much as possible. Um, uh, and then um, also just to support them as well. Yeah. Um, one less person that needs, uh, you know, to go on unemployment perhaps, or what else, you know? So it was just made sense to go hyper local with our victory gardens. All right. So let's get practical as far as, as how much of your produce is coming. Is it a practical business decision? Is it a smart business decision or is it just something that's, you know, part of your ethos? So you struggle and grind and like survive mightily to get, you know, that produce out um, there. Yeah. Cost. But is this a smart business decision for you? Uh, I, I think it's smart because people want it. It's definitely more expensive. Yeah. You know, um, but it's still not prohibitive. You know, just basically you can get as long as you're good at, at working the numbers and looking at food costs, things like that. Um, 
you know, you know, there's some always some dogs on the menu that nice. the food cost is higher. Maybe you have a lost leader like our oysters. We do dollar oysters every night and we sell a ton of them, but people come in for them. So I basically take that out of food costs and put it in marketing. I was um, about to say, it's a marketing. It, yeah. Thing. You know, it's like they're not coming if the oysters aren't cheap. So may as well just forget about that in food costs. Um, uh, and then, um, you know, you can charge more for nicer food. So uh, the more is you there charge, a demand in the market yeah. there? I mean, Portland, I know Portland, but I want to let you answer this. A demand in the market for higher quality that there's a value assigned to that that you think is is worthwhile. Because some places they struggle to charge because someone else is doing the same Brussels sprouts down the street and they're, you know, a half the price. You know, um, Portland is, I think, nationally perceived as like this really great restaurant town and it is. But there's also um, an element to the Portland dining scene that really likes good deals. They like things they're familiar with. Um, the Portland dining scene is relatively new. It's not like this really mature scene like in, in San Francisco or, or New York. And sure. I think a lot of guys like me came here thinking that it was going to be, um, you know, the same le- the same type of diner. I don't say level because that doesn't mean New York diners are better than Portland diners. But sure. um, I think Portland diners are just a little more uh, – they're just so, like they like things a little more simple, you know. No restaurant that I know of has been super high end, like an EMP. There's been a few that have done well. Castagna has done well, yeah. You know, but the list is really short. Where it was super high end, technical, plating, concept, all of that. Um, it just doesn't necessarily always work that well for here for Portlanders. So, um, to answer your question, no, there's not. Rather like, know the name of the chicken, right? I right. Think that's, exactly. I well, think you know, not that. Yeah, this whole. Portlandia thing. Um, but yeah, perhaps I think they want to just have maybe a more down to earth experience for the most yeah. part, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I like that too. Ultimately I left 11 Madison park because I like smoke. I like, you know, I like, you know, saute a lot of the things were being done in bags, right. you know, at that time it was, uh, you know, foam and all sous vide, um, which is good. I still do foam and I still sous vide occasionally. Yeah, you know, has this. and to your point, it's not a necessary level. It's dining is personal yeah, and it's it's, relational yeah. and as is it's cooking. The, Portland's personality as diners doesn't gravitate towards hot, like super high end stuff, but they do love great food. And you can get, I mean, and they know, like, you'll have to pay more for a steak. And from a food cost perspective, like, food cost isn't everything. You want to sell, you don't take, I learned this from Danny Meyer, and it's a great quote. My, my, chef, my cooks always love it when I quote these guys that I work for. Um, you know, you don't take percentages to the bank. And so if you're if the lobster dish has terrible food costs, but you make twenty five dollars on it, yep. you want to sell that one over the chicken. That's great for food costs, but you only make, you know, eight. I mean, sure. right. Yeah. So, I mean, there's balance there that you look for. But in this case, to come full circle, you know, this produce and great produce isn't part isn't doesn't disrupt that flow. Uh, you know, I'm and, glad to hear. All right, I want to yeah. touch on your staff because you mentioned, you know, your family and some of the people that you are working with are actually bringing produce to the restaurant. I want to talk about that. The ability to empower your people and entice and excite your people. We talk a lot about investing in the human capital that, you know, we chum through people too quickly in the industry, all of those dynamics that are at the forefront of, you know, labor shortages and labor issues, culture issues, things like that. So having your staff bought in at that level, talk about the importance of that for them, for morale, for motivation, and then maybe we'll get into the ability then to translate that to the guest experience. Yeah, I don't know, good question. Um, both uh, the chef that I have at Daisy um, was with me at Brass Room on Mart eight years ago. Um, and he's coming on a little bit while he, he pursued uh, you know, uh, uh, an education, but you know, he's basically like family. Um, uh, front and the two other leads that are here with me now have been with me for several years. Um, you know, and they all have their own input with me. I, I, you know, I'm getting older. I like, I like the idea of being able to give, give away some of the, the, the duties. Um, and we opened the second rest, the second restaurant in large part to kind of give me a break. We'd have a main chef at, at, at Daisy and a main chef at Vertigree, but kind of didn't work out like that. So it wound up just like creating more work for me. Um, so, but you did it because you had people that were, they were accelerating to the point, like you either had to open another restaurant to give them a bump in pay, title, responsibility, or they yeah. were going to go somewhere else. We've def- I've definitely 
like brokered or I've offered people to 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 go other places because they 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 outgrew us. Sure. Um, you know, and uh, you know, I, I think uh, one one thing to touch on the the subject is that our customers, especially at Vertigree, because we've been open so long, know the front of house staff very well, and they know us very, and and they know me well, and um, I think their talent of being able to create that rapport and that sense of hospitality, that sense of you know we'll do anything we can to. Um, you know, make you feel welcome and make you feel like this is the place you can go when you're having a bad day or whatever the place to celebrate. It's just a safe place for everybody. Yeah. Um, and I think they appreciate that. And, um, you know, it's tough out there now. There's a lot of acrimony in our society. There's a lot of, of fear. Um, and we're trying to, to offer a neutral place on a lot of these subjects. We're not neutral about a lot of the things such as, you know, the race and um, sort of the race discussion. Um, you know, there's certainly no place for anything but but love for everyone. Um, and uh, so that's one, th one place where we're not neutral. But other than that, we like to remain in a place where, you know, you know, yeah, sort of in the space. Center. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, so, so I, I want to then talk about the beet and the Brussels sprout. Let's stay there. And then you tell oh, me okay. the actual, actual ingredients that you're going out there. I'm always fascinated. And you mentioned it. Like people don't like a lot of vegetables because they've had the worst possible representation of that in the way that it was cooked, in the way that it was produced, in the way that it was handled, all of that. You're now trying to reimagine a lot of uh, individual ingredients, but just people's respect and understanding and relationship with certain ingredients. So let's talk about your staff gets a beet, gets a Brussels sprout that somebody grew, that somebody that you know, that you've met, that's a part of your team, part of your family, your extended, you know, cohorts, and they are able to put that on a plate. I want to talk about that. How important is that? And how are you communicating to your team how important a beet is to to your restaurant? Well, first of all, um, you know, I mean, people's food memories are, um, I don't know, for me, they're very strong. And I, that probably goes without saying. And their associations are very strong with it. So somebody might not like a Brussels sprout for the reason my mom did, because her mom hammered them. Or it could be that that smell represents like anything to them. It could be, you know, uh, olfactory senses or have like a, a big recall. So it could be, yeah. it brings yeah. up a bad actual physical, or, uh, it physically evokes a bad memory for them. Um, I, I think the actual ingredients are, are sort of, um, maybe collateral in this as like yeah. the whole experience of just providing what people need when they go out. And obviously at the base level, they need to be fed and they're hungry, but we're trying to offer more than that. Of course. Um, I do like to have stories about where the ingredients come from for my staff, because for them, it's just an open way, obvious way to create a rapport with the guests. And, you know, but they also have to read the guests. The guests might not want to talk to them, yeah. you know, <laughs> and there's a lot of that too. I mean, there's, and that's a talent that they have, um, you know, that, that they develop over the years of, of taking care of people and, you know, just reading them and, and, and just giving them a good time. Um, so I, I also try not to like, try not to overcook that aspect of no pun intended, but like, you know, we just want, we don't want it to be like when we do wine tastings, we don't like really geek out on or and wine pairings, excuse me. Like we don't really geek out on like, you, you know, the different notes and the minerality of the wine pairing with the, you know, the, you know, this, that, or the other thing about the food, because we wanted to, we want to just like, we want to just enjoy it. We don't want to like, it take, we don't want to like take it all apart and see how good. it works. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense just, me. yeah you know, like, you said, you said telling people the story of kind of the people growing the products and, and I joked a little bit about the name of the chicken, which actually comes from Danny Meyer talking about the name of the cow, where people right, are okay. telling the story to understand the name of the cow, right? And so I love that we got to go full circle talking about, you know, Danny Meyer with that. Uh, for, for the restaurants themselves right now, what produce are you really excited about? What's come in the last weeks, month? What's coming? What's about to come? What's something you're excited about to get us salivating a little bit for some produce coming out of the earth here soon? So uh, my guy, Stuart, uh, who does Fennel Urban Farms, the one in the Baptist uh, 
side lot um, awesome. is uh, he's just like a wizard with mixed greens. And I make fun of people because, you know, I, I don't know. When I go out to eat, I usually get stuff that I would think that I can't make at home. We yeah. don't feel like making it home. And so the way we sell mixed greens over the years at all these restaurants has been has been funny. But this guy does killer greens. Um, and uh, that's not just mixed greens. Uh, he does all this like baby kale. And um, uh, we do um, uh, uh, all – what else does he do? He does um, all the durable like braising greens, which is yeah. – you know, I don't know if it's my southern nature, but I love kale, collards, shard. I mean, he's got shard that's his – big as a beach ball that comes in here awesome. and it was like that was in the, the first few weeks of june where we had actually gotten a lot of rain for portland then and they were just everything was blowing up um and um he's he's like a tomato whiz too portland's not known for its tomatoes right um the season just happens too late and a lot of people are kind of like their their clock has moved into fall um and so it, it's it's an odd season here for an east coaster because you're starting to see the pumpkins and the squash um, and you know, the fall stuff, and they're still really nice tomatoes. So you see this blend of a menu here that's not necessarily like a traditional season specific. Um, so that's an interesting time to cook. It's, 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 it's actually Portland my favorite. Season, man. Yeah. It's Portland weird. I like it. Tomato and pumpkin. Let's go. I know. I know. And so you'll see like those things on the menu, which are kind of uh, anachronisms elsewhere makes sense here because yeah. the way the seasons work um and then um oh man i don't know it's a tough question it's like what's your favorite song uh you know? i hear you like, good that's why I want, you're the chef in the garden yeah. that's why i wanted to know but i think the greens is an interesting thing uh a lot of the farms that i go to out here in colorado greens is the like it's why i go to your farm and i'll buy yeah. other things because to your point the lettuces that we have started to consume are the least flavorful thing in our diet so often. And yeah. like, I don't I barely, I put some oil on and salt on a lot of greens because they have such intensity of flavor. So I'm hundred percent believer in what you're talking about. All right. To yeah, wrap these, up. These, yeah. These, these last so long too. They last yeah. for two weeks. True. If you don't go through them and you get a box of mixed greens from the store, you got four days at the most. Yeah. If that, if that, uh, so we always get some acknowledgements out there. And, uh, and I saw this, uh, Seamus from Acadia was on the list of people that you acknowledged. And we had, you know, Ryan McCaskey on, uh, some time back from Acadia. Uh, tell, tell us about Seamus. I was fascinated when I saw that. So, uh, Acadia is, uh, he's my next door neighbor in Portland, Oregon. Uh, he bought the place basically like six months after I okay. got not Acadia in Chicago. No, it's in Portland. Right. Yeah. I think <laughs> there's that's probably, what I saw. And I was like, oh, I think Acadia. there's probably two dozen Acadia. I was like, yeah. how did you come across Acadia in Chicago? All right, my bad, Acadia no, in think, Portland. No, I'm sure that mistake is made frequently. Um, it's uh, probably the same premise, though. Um, uh, sort of New Orleans y bistro is what he does. And he's mm -hmm. got a killer um, bourbon collection and a killer wine list. And his, his right, he's had regulars. He bought it from the previous chef, and the restaurant's been there almost 20 years, I think maybe at this point. And they've got great business. He bought it, and um, you know, we're, he's one of those guys where I can like go knock on the door in the middle of service and be like, "I need butter" or whatever it is. You know, it's that cup of sugar from the neighbor thing. And so, yeah, shout out to Seamus. He's probably watching it. right now. He's a big. I, I I'm I'm jealous of his social media game. Well, hopefully he watches this now because this show is all about acknowledgement. Acknowledging each other makes a big, big difference. The fact that we got to hear about Stuart and Seamus and that you have staff involved in uh, in the gardening process, I think it really matters. And so I yeah. appreciate the work that you're doing. I appreciate you being on. Appreciate you yeah. sharing a little bit about you know being a chef and having the garden and the importance of that. So no, nah, I, I love talking about this. I can talk about food all day and <laughs> restaurants all day. That and people too. So. Well, you got oysters to serve today, so we'll let you get back to it. Johnny Nunn, right, thank you so much for being on the show, and uh, have a great day, my friend. All right. Bye, everybody. All right. Johnny Nunn, chef owner of Daisy Bar and Cafe and a Bear Degree restaurant in Portland. If you're out there, check them out for sure. And uh, the garden, I think it's a really important thing. We're going to have a lot more conversations, I think, with chefs, with gardeners, with farmers, with urban farmers, because I'm fascinated. Just, I think it's important, full stop. 
that in these times may be more important because we're seeing the vulnerability of our food system and the supply chain. And so I think the opportunity to hyper localize, there's a huge opportunity right now. And so I'm grateful for any chefs out there that are making it a, a mainstay, a pillar of their brand. So thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate you as always. Have a great day.